Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Kaiser Education Series. My name is Gabe Derman, and I'm a human performance and education specialist at Kaiser. Today is our final panel of the KES for spring summer of 2022, and we saved it for a special episode. We are joined by two amazing guests that are world experts in the history of physical culture and sport, strength and conditioning, and coaching. This episode will be slightly different than our usual format, as we'll do a hybrid of presentation format led by our two panelists. I'm so excited to get started. I wish we had the entire day for this, but of course we do not, so I'll get right to the introductions. Our first panelist is Dr. Jason Shirley. Dr. Shirley is a professor of kinesiology and coordinator of the Strength Conditioning Educational Program at the University of Wisconsin Whitewater. A member of the Longhorn Powerlifting Team, he earned his bachelor's in kinesiology from the University of Texas, his master's from Stephen F. Austin, and then returned to Texas for his PhD in interdisciplinary sports studies. Dr. Shirley is an NSCA certified strength conditioning specialist and certified athletic trainer. He has experience as a strength coach or athletic trainer in professional hockey, baseball, football, and has also spent time as a sport coach. Our second panelist is Dr. Jan Todd. Dr. Todd is the chair of and professor in the Department of Kinesiology and Health Education at the University of Texas at Austin, where she directs the PhD program in physical culture and sports studies. Dr. Todd is a director and co-founder of the H.J. Luther Stark Center for Physical Culture and Sports, which is considered to be the largest public archive in the world devoted to the study of physical fitness, strength, resistance training, and conditioning for athletes. Recognized as a pioneer in the history of women in weight training, she set more than 60 national and world records and was included in the Guinness Book of Records for over a decade. She was the first woman to total 1,000, 1,100, and 1,200 pounds, and the first woman to officially lift 400 pounds in the deadlift and 500 pounds in the squat. She was inducted in the International Powerlifting Hall of Fame and is the first woman to work as a strength conditioning coach at a major university. Lastly, she currently serves as a director of the Arnold Strongman Classic and the Rogue Strongman Invitational. To learn more information about the Stark Center and rich history of physical culture and sport, please check out www.starkcenter.org. I also highly, highly recommend that you get yourself a copy of the book, Strength Coaching in America, a history of the innovation that transformed sports. It is co-authored by our two guests along with Terry Todd and is absolutely a must if you're a strength conditioning coach or fitness professional. You can find it on the UT Press website and we'll be sure to include the link in the published episode. Throughout the presentation, feel free to drop any questions you have in the chat and we'll allot some time at the end of the presentation and discussion to address them to Dr. Shirley and Dr. Todd. Dr. Todd, Dr. Shirley, thank you so much for joining us. Dr. Todd, I'm gonna to pass it to you to share your screen and get us started on this presentation. We'll take a quick 30 seconds or so break when Dr. Todd is done to transition, transition to Dr. Shirley's portion of the presentation. How's that? Did that work, Gabe? Yep, good to go. Okay, well, thank you for having me. And, um, and I have to do a little disclosure here because Gabe was actually my student years ago, a while back, and, and a great student at that time. And one of the things that made me actually do this, because I don't do a lot of podcasts, as you know, was, was the fact that when he was a student, he actually showed a great appreciation for strength, which, um, and wrote a really, really great paper in my class as well that I still remember. So kudos to you for that. Um, so Jason and I are gonna split up history a little bit today, and I'm gonna talk to you first about some early times. And, and obviously, in case anybody's interested, I should explain that the book that this, what we're talking about today is partly based on, um, was a project that in part drove from Jason's dissertation. And so if, in, and Terry and I were both part of the writing of this book and the background and the research. And there are obviously, um, you know, I'm, I'm very, very proud of the project, but I also just wanted to sort of give, you know, major props to Jason because uh, a lot of this really came out of the work that he did while he was a doctoral student at UT. And um, anyway, and it is a really, really good book. Um, and it was actually nominated, if I can just brag a little bit more, um, at the North American Society for Sport History. We were the runner up at the, for the Book of the Year Award uh, for 2019. So, okay. So what I'm gonna do is try to cover a lot of time very quickly. And I'm also going to primarily be talking in this presentation about men. And there's a lot that I could say about women, but because Jason and I are probably both gonna to try to do around 20, 25 minutes or so of like present presenting. I'm gonna not do women today, but maybe that's a conversation, Gabe, we can have down the road at some point. 
or we can also talk about that in the chat afterwards, which would be very happy to do that. So I wanna start with the ancient world. Um, most of us these days have some idea that the whole process of resistance exercise and resistance training is actually not a new phenomenon. And when we think about this historically, most of us would you know, sort of think back to, you know, what do we know about ancient Greece, about the Olympic games and things like that. You know, if you're a historian, one of the things that you are always looking for is like, what's the real evidence? What do I really have that I could point to that suggests that there might've been a culture of strength or a culture of weightlifting at another period of time? And so we always often turn to ancient Greece as kind of our idea that that's where ancient training started um, because we have things that we can actually point to like these two particular stones. So the Bybon stone, of course, you know, again, then we don't really know exactly what to make of the inscriptions, but supposedly, you know, Bybon threw me over my head, over his head with one hand. So that's a 315 pound stone. I probably have some friends in the strongman community that I could easily imagine could lift it with two hands and toss it with one hand a little short distance. So that one seems somewhat realistic. Um, the larger stone that I have in the photograph here is, an, is a stone that comes from the island of Thera. And that's a stone that actually weighs 966 pounds. So that circular inscription that you can see on that stone is actually saying that Eumastus, the son of Cretobolus, lifted me from the earth. So if we think about that, like, is that a, what does that actually mean? I mean, you know, if it's like the Denny stones, you need to quote wind beneath the stones and you've lifted it. Just lift it up a little bit and you get credit for the lift. Um, do we think that he lifted it above all the way to his waist? Probably not. But it's one of those stones that you really makes you wonder about what they really meant by that and just also wish that you could have been there to see it perform. Today, lots of people could have done that, obviously, with a harness some sort of apparatus, um, but we don't exactly know what, what was there. But what we do know more definitively in terms of athletics is that stones and other kinds of weights were actually being used by athletes because one reason we start in Greece is because of its association with the Olympic Games, which are really the first organized sporting events that we know about that last for a continued period of time and on which we have records. And that's again, the trick is what we have records for. So if you were to ever to go to the museum in Greece connected to, the, to Mount Olympus, you will find some stones there as well as other kinds of evidence of things that people use, which suggest, don't prove, but suggest that perhaps people were doing some systematic sorts of training. There is one particular stone there that um, is actually very interesting. It was the stone that's named for Zenoraeus. And as you can see in the content here on the slide, it's a a rectangular stone, about 13 inches wide, 16 inches long, so a pretty big block, and it weighs about 100 pounds. And it's inscribed saying it was the throwing stone of Cenereus. So again, is this a shot put? Is this something that he does in practicing for shot put? Is it something he does to make himself stronger in his shoulders so that he can be a better warrior? We don't exactly know, but the same impetus that, you know, causes us to put a picture on a t-shirt or to brand ourselves in diff different ways, people like to be known, like people like to sort of claim their records. And that's one of the traditions that we have that goes historically back. So one of the stories from ancient Greece that I would like to help debunk a bit if I can, is the story of Milo of Cretona, the famous Greek wrestler who actually won, um, won the wrestling championships at, at the Olympia six different times. Over 24 years, he was the Olympic wrestling champion. And a lot of people credit him. You can actually open up dozens of books on the hist on how to do barbell training or weight training. And it'll talk about the fact that the father of progressive resistance exercise is Milo of Cretona. And the story that that's based on is a story suggesting that he began picking up a calf when it was small. And as the calf grew stronger, he picked it up every day. And so over time, the calf grew, Milo got stronger, and this was the secret of his strength, aka progressive resistance exercise. So there is no proof of this being true. That's just what I want to say. So like a lot of things from ancient times, no one was writing, in the at writing things down at the time when Milo actually lived. There are most of the stories of early Greece 
um, were actually recorded by people who lived two, three, and 400 years after the time in which Milo lived. So there, is a, there, are, two, there are two versions of this story which actually were written in what we call ancient Greece, meaning before the time of Christ. And so Athenaeus, who um, is the one who actually talks directly about him carrying the bull that he is, you know, continued to live through his, the bull's life and carry it the length of the Olympic Stadium. That story is actually written about 300 years after the time that Milo actually lived. But the other part of that story that makes it like preposterous to believe is that Athenaeus then goes on and says, and then of course he killed it, not with a ding, sorry, not with a dingle blow, but with a single blow to the head, sorry, bad typo, a single blow to the head, and then he ate it all in one day. So if we think about it in that way, we kind of realize that's not possible. And so this is, it's in the realm of folklore. Now there's another ancient scholar who also mentions the fact that, that Milo did pick up and carry a calf but there's no, there's no, he did it every day. There's none of the rest of that stuff. So in any case, it's just what it is. So it's a great story. It's sort of like other folk legends, perhaps that we have of people like Paul Bunyan or John Henry. And I would just say, when we start thinking about who's the father of resistance exercise, I actually think there may be some people more connected to science and, and real athletics that might be better choices. So what other things we do have from ancient Greece though, is we have, Halteries. So these are the precursors of dumbbells. Halteries were hand weights that were originally made to help people jump further. And so you would swing, running along, swinging them and then leap forward. But by the time you get to around the time of Christ, right around um, the sort of the birth, well, really even like a hundred years before Christ's time, when Rome has taken over most of this part of the world, halteries are also being described in a number of different documents as things that you do for arm exercise. And so there's, there's some interesting discussion in various people's works about using them to strengthen the arms as well as for looping. So the other interesting thing, some of the other interesting references from ancient times, there's a, there's a Epictetus is another person who has written a good bit about ancient exercise as, by the way, has Philostratus, who I won't talk about today because we need to move forward. But, but Epictetus also describes training with what he calls the mortar and the pestle. And the first time I encountered this reference, I was really struggling to kind of figure out what he meant by this. Because when I think about a mortar pestle, I'm thinking about the thing on the bottom of the slide that looks like what you would make guacamole with, right? You would mash up your avocados in that, and then that's it. But when I started thinking about it more in an international sense and began learning more about what happened in India and also China, I began to realize that two things were true. One was that, of course, everybody was going to try to continue to make things out of the materials that you had on hand at that time, which for the most part were stone, perhaps logs, but also that the idea of training with big clubs, big long clubs, which I, as you can see in this Old photograph from India look a lot like the mortar there in the little mortar and pestle bowl. That's also kind of the same thing. The, um, the other thing that's interesting is that in ancient China, there's also a custom of lifting these round ceremonial, what they call dings, and uh, which often weighed multiple hundred pounds and they would lift them up over their heads. So how does all this work? I mean, why would Romans be talking about this? Well, it's because the world was a big, I mean, the world was already growing smaller because of trade and trade routes. And so things were beginning to migrate from China, you know, into India and then on over perhaps into Rome itself. So speaking of India real quickly, just a couple of photographs. These are obviously modern photos, but showing some of the kinds of ancient implements that were part of Kushti training which is in Kushti, K-U-S-H-T-I was the form, sort of ancient form of wrestling. It's still practiced in China. I mean, in India, sorry. Um, it's kind of a form almost of, it's, it's partly religious in nature, partly a manhood ritual, but, um, but as a custom within that, the Kushti community, there's still many people who continue to train with traditional methods. So they use things like garnals, the ring around his neck, other kinds of clubs like here, 
Um, and of course, what we know happens then, and we're gonna now take a big, a big leap in history, is that those implements are part of what becomes um, introduced to Europe in the late 18th and early 19th century and begins to transform our world in terms of strength training really at the same time as the world of sport and athletics is taking off in Britain and Europe. And so when we think about Indian clubs, which are a major part of what we continue to do in our training today, and have had this enormous revival over the last 20 years or so, um, the club and the swinging of Indian clubs is really one of the oldest strength traditions that exist in the world. Um, much older than barbells, much older than what we would really traditionally call dumbbells. And when they, and what happens to them and how they come into Europe has to do with the fact that the British begin to go to India in the 18th century. They start taking over part of it. They introduce the East India Company and then put military forces in place to make sure that the rights of, um, of their, their company is being supported there properly and defended. And but but when they're there, they are impressed by the physical, the physical appearance of some of the, of the ancient, I mean, excuse me, some of the Indian natives who have followed these training wrestlers. And wrestling was really important in 18th and early 19th century India. And so, so the British military then bring this tradition back to Britain. And it really becomes popularized around the middle of the 19th century when the man in the photo in the image on the right, Henry Thomas Harrison, gives an exhibition between Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. Um, it's at a celebration, it's in a public park in uh, downtown London, there are lots of people there. And Harrison, who was not a giant of a man, um, is able in, in, that, in that exhibition, he swung, swung two 37 pound clubs. He also swung around a single club weighing 47 pounds. Um, but the main thing about him was that he also became like the poster boy for the, like the first physique man. And so his body with his shirt off in this illustration, which appeared in the London Illustrated News and in local papers all across Great Britain, also shows up in New York City in American newspapers. And, um, and, and it is much discussed because he doesn't look much like normal men do at this time because he has been doing this continued training. So Harrison was also um, the son of a gym owner and, um, and he continued, he actually began doing public performances. He also was a champion fencer. And so he would give exhibitions where he did Indian club swinging and swordsmanship. And one of the things that he would do in his act is he would take a carcass of a lamb or sheep and he would show his strength by cutting through with his sword, the body of the animal in one swing, um, which sometimes didn't work well, sadly. Um, and there were some funny accounts in newspapers about maybe it took him three swipes, but you can imagine somebody doing that today on stage. This was just such a different time. Harrison did, however, write an important book, Indian Clubs and Dumbbell Training. And, um, and in that book, it's one of the earliest books to directly advocate the use of club training, IK, and we're saying here, resistance training for athletes. He talks about it being a good form of ex uh, exercise, sorry, for pedestrians, which we would now call walkers and runners. And pedestrianism, as it was called at that time, instead of track and field, was actually one of the the main forms of sport that was emerging at mid-century. So shifting gears slightly, I wanted to talk a little bit about how and when we begin actually sort of looking scientifically at strength and how that begins to impact what we do um, as strength and athletics develops in the 19th century. So some of you have probably seen one of these somewhere, maybe in a museum, or maybe you have an old exercise physiology professor somewhere who has one in his lab. But this is a hand color illustration showing ways to use Renier's um, dynamometer, which was actually invented in about 1780. So in the Enlightenment era, which thinking about that as the era of the late 
you know, in the 1700s, there were several really important things that happened that sort of advanced the cause of strength, if I can put it that in that way. One was that there was a, um, a curiosity about measuring strength, but more importantly, and actually less appreciated is the work that this man did, who is one of the, I think, sort of unsung heroes of sports science. And this is Sir John Sinclair. So Sinclair was a Scottish nobleman. He was a member of parliament. He was an avid sportsman. And by that, I mean that he loved hunting and horseback riding and, um, and the kinds of sports that upper class British gentry did at that time. He was also though wealthy and had, a, um, had employees who worked for him. Sorry, I lost you. Hello, hello. We can still see and hear you. Okay, because I've lost my, I've, I'm seeing a light. I'm not sure, there it is. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, in any case, thanks for telling me that though, Jason, if it happens again. And I didn't touch anything at that moment, so hopefully we're okay. Anyway, but the thing about Sinclair was he kind of, he had time on his hand. And when we think about knowledge and the creation of knowledge, like if you actually were to ask people like who were the, who were the historians of the 18th century, most of them were wealthy guys who had personal libraries. They weren't academics like Jason and I are. And that was also true with some of the early scientists. So Sinclair decided that one of the things that he wanted to do was to create like encyclopedias of knowledge. And so he did this huge survey of agriculture in Britain and, um, and created this multi-volume thing on agriculture in Britain and Scotland. He also was very interested in health. And so one of the things that he did is over a period of years, he had his assistants and secretaries working on trying to create like, like the Wikipedia of um, health information. And so what he did was he went back to the ancient texts and he was trying to like go back and read Galen and Mercurialis and all these early people who were writing about health and find out what was said about health through time. But the really important thing he did was because he liked horse racing and dog fights and these kinds of things and boxing in particular, he decided that he was gonna write everybody that he could find in Britain and on the continent and ask them how they trained athletes and horses, chickens for cockfighting and uh, dogs for dog fighting. So it was this incredible effort to like figure out how training works. And, um, and so he wrote them, he wrote, or he had his secretaries write the letters and then sent them to coaches and, and other members of the gentry who then wrote back. And so these two things that get published in the really early first decade of the 19th century are really interesting. The collection of papers on the subject of athletic exercises and the results of the inquiries regarding athletic exercise are incredible to look at because for one thing that athletes, male, human athletes and racehorses are actually being trained in many of the same ways. So it's like, there's not like a lot of, like we're, we're withholding water, we're trying to make the flesh drier. There's all these kind of strange ideas about what you eat, when you eat, all this kind of stuff. But in addition though, we're also gathering really the first information on this. So it's really like the first big data collection that we have that talks about strength. And one of the other things though that comes out of that is that he is a fan of, of weightlifting. And so Sinclair is one of the earliest voices, not, not the earliest, but one of the early voices that actually talks about the advantage of lifting weights. Um, and he's not exactly saying here, and you should do this to be a better boxer, but obviously it, it sort of falls into that. And so, as you can see here in this passage, which is from the Code and Health of Longevity, which is the four volumes that he and his uh, staff come up with about what we need to know about health and longevity at this time. And the athletic papers, by the way, are published in that volume as well. So um, that's, which is where I discovered them years ago when I was working on my dissertation. But he talks here about the fact that we have swing leads or dumbbells. And, um, and the fact that somebody was actually writing about these in the time of Queen Elizabeth, and that would have been a guy named John Northbrook. Um, but then there are also this other reference here to 
to them who about, you know, that they help the posture, they train with open windows. And some of this is actually really um, interesting because it's so, so early at this time. So another early person that you may not think about as a weightlifter is Ben Franklin. Franklin was also kind of a scientist and he went to Europe and he was familiar with things. He actually um, wrote a book on swimming, which is kind of a wonderful little small book. Um, he also invented swim fins, which many of you may not know, but one of, one of the many things that he did for us. But he was a very serious believer in dumbbell training in the sense that um, we're sort of seeing it as something that helps to fight aging. And, um, and that, you know, as he says here that he's in this letter, he's doing it as a daily form of exercise. He doesn't drink wine, and, but he thinks this is helping him to live longer. But the other thing about Franklin is that he's also beginning to try to quantify exercise in interesting ways, which is also happening in other places during the Enlightenment. And so he's actually talking about the advantages, for example, of stair climbing over walking over flat land in terms of how it increases your pulse. He talks about the fact that when he trains with dumbbells, as he tells his son, and William is the son here, that in 40 swings with dumbbell swings, he has actually quickened his pulse from 60 to 100 beats in a minute. And, uh, and that he knows that this is also that the, that the warmth increases with the pulse. Warmth, of course, means to him a good thing. He sees this as the result of exercise. So it's like some of the earliest stuff we have um, sort of looking at aerobic effect. The other thing that happens in the, 19, in the, excuse me, the late 18th century is we begin to see more interest in measuring strength. And, um, and so there were various things that were created to, do, to test strength. So this, these are actually, this is the Graham Desiglier's dynamometer, which was first invented around 1860s. These were big clunky things. They were heavy, they weren't portable. You know, if you were looking at the, the top left corner as I'm looking at the screen, that's a device that you stood on and then the, you raise the weight and it would sort of measure things for you, sort of like on a doctor's scale. Not very practical, but this machine that I showed you in the opening slide for this section was really practical. It was lightweight, it was portable. It was originally designed to test the strength of horses because people wanted to know how, many, how much horsepower things had. And so it was created for that. But then very quickly, people began to realize that they could also test humans. And so a lot of times when you look in the 19th century literature, they'll talk about back strength, like how they measure back strength. And that picture at the top left is how they would do that using a dynamometer. At the bottom, the same thing's being done to measure horses. So, so what we have then is coming into the 19th century, we have the beginnings of some scientific facts we have an interest in records that's developing, and we have more and more information from overseas, meaning from Europe at this point, that's beginning to infiltrate into America so that in the 19th century in the United States, what we really see is kind of an explosion of interest in um, strength and sport. So part of that movement comes from the, um, the birth of uh, of the German gymnastics system, which gets brought over to the United States in the 1820s. Most of us, when we think about this in the early stages, the movement was much more about using pommel horses and climbing ladders and, and doing some of the things that you see the guys doing in this picture here from 1828. But dumbbells were also part of this and they also used an implement called Eisenstaba, which were basically about 10 to 12 pound heavy bars. They didn't have globes on the end like a barbell, but they were heavy enough that you could do things overhead. Because the Germans came and they started creating these open air gymnasiums, and because we they also began to have competitions in which people ran races through shots and did other kinds of things, you begin to see across the United States, the growth then of public gymnasiums where men can go and train. If you look at the like first 30 years of the 19th century, a lot of those gyms were actually not just barbell gyms, of course, but they were places where you went to learn boxing. 
In some cases, they also had shooting ranges in the bottom where you could shoot guns and practice things like that. And many of them taught fencing uh, and swordsmanship. The couple of important gems I want you to remember if I, like if I'm talking to my class, one would be William Wood's gym, which opens in New York in, in 1835. Wood is the big guy in the center there. And his gym emerges right around the same time that say baseball is gonna to begin to take off in the United States. Boxing is gonna to begin to become a much bigger sport. Rowing is, is growing in, in participation and it won't be too much longer before rowing will become our first recognized collegiate sport. Wood himself went to Yale and was a rower for the Yale at, during that time. Um, and so he's a guy, as you can see here, who loved to go and compete in sport. He then opens a gym and because he's an athlete and he's good, other people then come to him, just like we now go to the gyms of the superstars to learn from them. And so he becomes this big figure in the emerging sport world of the 19th century. Now, the two other men that are sitting with him, as you can see here, um, is Henry Biermeyer on the left, and then beside him, this guy, if you can see my, my mouse, is William Buckingham Curtis. So Biermeyer and Curtis, who are the two men in the photograph here without shirts, if you look at them compared to the other members of the New York Track Club, you might notice that they actually have a lot more muscle. I mean, it's a kind of shocking thing so there's their teammates, and there they are. So Biermeyer and Curtis open, come to New York City after the Civil War. They have, Curtis has previously, previously been living in Chicago, where he actually ran a gym for a guy named Otignon, which was like a chain gym. There was one in New York, and then they opened one in Chicago that Curtis ran. And anyway, his, it's, he's involved in weightlifting in many, many ways. But Curtis was the kind of guy who would go out to the Caledonian Games event and he would hold the record in the shot. He would hold the record for the 100 meter dash. He would hold the record in the mile. And then he very likely would go back to the gym and do some weightlifting event because he was just this sort of extraordinary superstar athlete. They were really both exceptional guys. They moved to New York City, they rent a house, and it's down in the Wall Street District where the Wall Street District is now. And so they take the house and what would be the parlor or the living room, they move everything out and they put in a boxing ring. And they take the downstairs bedroom and they fill that up with dumbbells where people can train. And in the end, one of the things that that house does is they actually end up founding the New York Athletic Club, which is the place where we give the Heisman Trophy and it still exists today. And they were the early founders of that. And they were both really serious weightlifters. Curtis actually ends up as the editor of the Spirit of the Times. And so he has this continued connection to weightlifting. He's respectable, okay? If I can say that in the right way. And he has this sort of, it's the, it's the athlete as model. It's not like he's writing a book about weightlifting, but he, you can see by looking at him and everything that he can do, that weightlifting hasn't hurt him either. And so it has enhanced his sport performance. And so he's like a good advertisement for it. So just a couple of other gym, Charles Ortenion's gym. This is an early photograph from, or drawing from 1845. You can see over here on the wall, there's a guy training with um, pulley weights. I know this is kind of faded out, but it is really old. Um, also a guy over here doing one-legged squats. This was a lot like what many early gyms looked at this time. Here's a, another picture, a much stronger picture of another early gym owner. And this is Aaron Molyneux Hewlett, who was a former boxer who had a private gym of his own and then was invited to become the director of the gymnasium at Harvard. And so he was there in the late 1850s into roughly the end of the Civil War. And I love this photograph because you can actually see some of the equipment that he used, the big Indian clubs, the boxing gloves, the bar, just this heavy metal bar. Notice there's not a barbell here, but there are two dumbbells down on the floor. And I love those clubs that you can take apart. I think those are so, these, I just think are so cool looking. So it's not clear to me, I'd love to know, 
whether George Parker Winship, who's the person that we associate with really introducing heavyweight training for athletics as well as people, whether he interacted much with Mullen and Hewitt when he was at Harvard. Because Winship goes to Harvard in 1854, and some of you may already know his story, know the fact that what he does then is he becomes a convert to a form of lifting called the health lift. Um, he begins doing this while he's a Harvard student. He's the smallest, weakest guy in the class. He becomes enraptured with this. He begins going around America giving lectures about it. He finishes his medical degree and he opens a medical practice in which he has his medical office and a gymnasium side by side. He may well be our first sports medicine doctor. Um, and so people, men and women saw him. Health lifting became a huge thing. There were gyms that opened all across America. There were, gy there were machines that were sold for home use. Women did, did it. If you walked Broadway in the 1870s, there were eight different gyms just on Broadway in New York City where you could do health lifting. And two of those gyms were just for women. And I'm skipping over him pretty quickly because he's, he's pretty well known at this point. Another 19th century person, and I'm just about to wrap up this. Another 19th century person who had a big influence on this was Sim Kehoe, another American. He actually went to Britain, met Harrison, the club swinger there, came back, decided he would start manufacturing clubs. Because one of the problems for athletes was access to equipment. But the thing about Kehoe that's interesting is that he also used athletes to sell his product. So this list of names in the background here, J.C. Heenan, Joe Carbon, Frank Queen, Con Fitzgerald, these are all famous athletes of the 19th century. They're baseball players, they're boxers. Um, Henry Hill's actually a saloon owner, but it was a saloon where people did sports. Okay, just a couple more things showing what was going on in the 19th century. So my argument for all this would be that most of these guys I've been talking about in various ways were informal strength coaches. In other words, if you were running a gym and athletes came to you and you were training them, you're not like a college strength coach, but in essence, you are still strength coach. So in the 1870s, when coaching was still, and when, started, when strength training was still on the rise and popular for athletics, um, a man named Ed James, who's a journalist, began publishing a series of training guides that, um, that included information about the records in various sporting events, including weightlifting, that talked about different training methods. He showed people how to train with dumbbells. He recommended the health lift that was popular with George Parker Winship, and of course also showed about how to use Indian club training. So these particular books, there was a series of these. The fifth one that came out in 1878 was actually called Health Strength and Muscle. Muscle. And, um, and it opened with this illustration of Charles Bennett. And except for his tiny feet, if you look at the rest of that body, you'd probably say, you know, that's a guy who's done a lot of serious training. So Charles Bennett was known as the champion strongman of California, which also suggests how things have spread across America by this time. So things slow down because Winship dies unexpectedly in 1876. And a lot of people blame weightlifting for his death. He has a stroke. It's unexpected. No autopsy was really done to identify exactly what happened in that stroke. But weightlifting becomes the cause of many people to start sort of turning away from weightlifting and start raising other objections, which if Jason doesn't talk about, I'll talk about later in the comments. But one other person that we should remember, well, two other people we should remember before I quit. Um, this is a really important figure in the evolution of strength training in, in America. And this is Professor Attila, who was a German professional strongman. His real name was Louis Durlacher, and he actually was the man who trained Eugene Sandow. He was his training partner. He came to America in 1893. He opened the gym that you can see in this bottom picture here. And this is actually, he's sitting actually back in this back corner here. Um, you can, this is in downtown New York City. That's a lot of iron in that gym. This is a long way from just having Indian clubs. And I include this picture so you can kind of get a sense of how much, what was possible by this time. 
The thing that you need to understand though, is that every barbell that's sitting on that floor was made by somebody specially. There was no mat, there were no mass produced barbells yet. And so that's one of the things that's holding athletic training back because we don't yet have a, a real source for that. But the thing about Attila is that when he came over in the 1890s, he was connected very quickly to boxing by the National Police Gazette. And he actually personally gave some exhibitions at some of the big major prize fights. And he also trained boxers like gentleman Jim Corbett. We actually have a letter at the Stark Center that Corbett wrote to him after winning one of his championship matches, talking about the fact that he didn't think he would have won the fight if it hadn't been for the work that he did with dumbbells, which is a pretty great testament. So I think the final thing I wanna just say is, as we think about the 19th century, there were actually a lot of athletes who were training with weights in small ways, privately, not as part of a team because we didn't really have big team sports yet, but yet it was already going on. And so some of the, some of the mainstream people might've been concerned about things like, will I get muscle bound, which I'm sure Jason will talk about. But in reality, a number of them just continued doing what they knew worked because they had learned it from a gym guy they knew or another athlete. One of the things though that people had at this time, and this is, I really will, will stop here, is that you had evidence of people like George Hackenschmidt, when you can see him here on the right as he was at the height of his career as the world's best wrestler, also a champion strongman. And then here he is at age 75, the product of weightlifting, still able to jump over the rope across those two chairs. And so those kinds of images left a big impression on people. So I'm going to stop there, Jason. I'll let you, maybe you can pick it up from there. I know we didn't practice this perhaps as well as we should have. All right. Yeah, and while, while Jason uh, pulls those up, uh, thank you, Jan, that was awesome. Uh, some of the notes that I have here and just things I was thinking about as you're going through some of those images. Uh, we've had some people on the KES already. And I know Dr. Rick Howard's with us was on our first one with long-term athletic development. When I look at that German gymnastics influence and you see kids climbing on the playground uh, or, or men climbing on the playground. And now we see those things resurfacing now and people in modern day stressing the importance of that. That's pretty cool. Um, you mentioned Halteris and, you know, we had a talk on force velocity implementation. Some of the ideas when we, we talked about ancient Greece, when they throw the Halteris backwards um, or testing single leg strength are some of the things that we discussed. And then um, plyometrics and just other things in training. I mean, I love the image. My favorite one there was probably, other than Hackenschmidt jumping over, that was the uh, single leg squat in the background. Isn't that great? Yeah. That's, that I was mean, a great image and a great sketch that you shared there because that's so something- So you, know, the, you yeah. know where the first picture of the single leg squat that I ever saw was? It's in a book from, I think it's, it's either 1828 or 1829, and it's of a woman doing a single leg squat for yeah. a PE class. I mean, think about that for a second. That same book also has pictures of women or girls doing chin-ups and dips. I mean, and that's the, that's some of what we, we, don't rec we don't remember that story as, as perhaps as well as we should. So, yeah, all right. For sure. So thank you for that. Yeah. That was awesome. I'm sure we'll have some more, you know, some more time towards the end there when uh, Dr. Shirley's done to talk a little bit more about some of that. So thank you. Okay. Right, go. Dr. Shirley, take it away. Cool. So um, when I was an undergrad at the University of Texas back in the late 90s and early 2000s, um, I was fortunate enough to have Dr. Terry Todd's class. And at the time, I was aspiring to be a strength coach. Like that was what I wanted to do for a living. And so one of the things that he mentioned in class was that there was a time where coaches didn't want athletes to lift weights. And in fact, if they did, they would threaten to kick them off the team. And so as someone who had grown up um, playing interscholastic football in Texas in the 90s, where if you wanted to be on the team, you had to be in the athletic period, you had to lift weights, it was just part of the deal. Um, I couldn't believe that people would believe that lifting weights could hurt athletic performance and in fact would go so far as to kick athletes off the team um, if they lifted. And so um, there are myriad examples of that. One of the 
or some of the ones that stick out. So this is uh, Clarence Biggie Munn, uh, Biggie being the nickname. So he was a football coach at Michigan State during the 1940s, very successful football coach. Um, and as an example, he had a really good running back whose name was Richard Berger, and he threatened to kick Berger off the team um, if he caught him lifting weights. And he, he said directly that that's, in fact, bad for you to lift weights. But instead, what you needed or what Berger needed in that case was to uh, get a heavy construction job, right? So it's sort of weight training in another form. Um, similarly, and I'll, I'll skip ahead a little bit, because I'm in Wisconsin, uh, one of the things that I, I tell my students in class um, to this effect is about, um, about the Packers, those great teams of the 1960s that won multiple NFL championships, and that Vince Lombardi himself was actually no fan of weightlifting, that those teams where they um, guys like Jerry Kramer that were outstanding uh, players and NFL or pro football hall of famers um, bragged about their conditioning and, and how in shape they were, but their conditioning consisted of running miles of doing sets of a hundred and more up downs, those kinds of things. So it was all cardio based stuff. And in fact, the Packers would find players if they caught them lifting weights during the season into 1971. So pretty late. Um, and so you can see Lombardi there. This is after he left the Packers. This is when he's with the Washington football team. And uh, he's demonstrating a device called the Exergenie. And so basically what that is, it's a pulley system that would connect to the fence and then you, uh, or to something else immovable. Um, and so then you would use that as a resistance. So they did things like this. They did isometrics during the 1960s, um, but they weren't allowed to lift weights. And so, um, like I said, it's was striking to me that those those great really dominant teams of the 60s wouldn't lift weights right and so how did that come about like one of the the basic idea of the book when people ask me you know what's the book about or or what's your dissertation about um the basic idea is how did we go from this world where coaches would threaten to kick athletes off the team if they caught them lifting weights to now we have professional strength and conditioning coaches who make almost a million dollars annually to teach people how to lift weights like that's a huge paradigm shift and so how did that happen um, essentially there are kind of, there were sort of two schools of thought feeding into the idea that lifting weights would hurt performance. Um, one is this sort of anecdotal idea of if you lift heavy weights, you're going to become muscle bound. And so there's kind of two things that feed into that as well. Um, one idea there being that people were familiar with, uh, individuals who lifted heavy weights, primarily, um, professional strongmen. And so professional strongmen tended to be very, very big, strong individuals, obviously, um, but not exactly um, the kind of individuals who you describe as being really agile and fast and those kinds of things. So part of the idea came from seeing strong men that, you know, if that's the product of lifting heavy weights, you probably don't want your athletes to be like that. Part of it, as Dr. Terry Todd and Dr. Jan Todd have talked about previously, is uh, based on horses. The idea that, um, you know, the, the workhorses that carry the heaviest wagons, that carry the heaviest loads were your Clydesdales, these big, strong horses, but they're not nearly as fast or agile as uh, smaller quarter horses that ran races. And so why would you want your athletes to be like these big draft horses? They lift heavy weights. You don't want your athletes to be like that. You want to be more like the quarter horses. So that was kind of that, that muscle bound idea. If you lift heavy weights, you're going to get really big and strong, but you're going to get slow and you're going to be uncoordinated. So we don't want to lift weights for that reason. The other part of it comes from the medical establishment. So there's this misunderstanding in the 1800s of the way that human physiology functions. There's this idea that the body functions kind of like a battery. There's a, a term that's thrown around related to that um, vitalism and vitality. And so the thought is if you devote a bunch of energy to one particular thing, blood flow is a way that this is discussed sometimes, um, that would rob other parts of the body of that energy and of that blood flow. So during the, the late 1800s in particular, um, with this um, urbanization where you start to see uh, more you know, factory types of jobs, more uh, white collar types of jobs, there's this concern that that sort of brain work is sapping the vitality of the body. And so if you then go and also lift weights, well, now you're, you're pulling energy from that battery to do your actual job. And then you're pulling additional energy from that battery to do your workouts. And so that could lead to a breakdown of sorts. And so um, if an individual were to lift heavy weights and to become very big and strong and muscular, then, then those hypertrophied muscles are going to consume extra energy and also consume blood that the rest of the body could be using. Um, sometimes authors or physicians at the time would refer to it as robbing the body of blood or of vitality, right? So 
um, those are kind of the two strains, this idea that we have to have this, this um, body in balance and the idea that an individual could become muscle bound with the training. Um, but you start to see some, some cracks in both of these paradigms. So one of them uh, comes in the form of Eugen Sandow, who's on the left there. Um, so Eugen Sandow learned to train using really heavy weights under Professor Attila. And so Sandow was at um, the 1893 Chicago World's Fair uh, or a Columbian Exchange in Chicago in 1893. And so at that show, thousands of people would have seen Sandow's physique. Among those thousands of people, you have uh, Bernard McFadden who publishes Physical Culture Magazine. You have Alan Calvert there who's pictured on the right. So Calvert had previously um, been familiar with this idea of training for balance. Um, one of the most famous proponents of that was um, Dudley Allen Sargent at Harvard. He was ran the, the gym at Harvard. And then one of his protégés of sorts um, was a guy named William Blakey. And so Blakey wrote this book called How to Get Strong and Stay, and Stay So. And so that book talks a lot about the idea of um, athletes being um, unhealthy in a way because they are imbalanced, right? So if you got rowers, they're going to have big, strong backs, big, strong biceps, et cetera, but they're going to be underdeveloped in other places. So the ideal for health, the ideal for performance is to for performance per se, but the idea, the ideal is to be fairly balanced. And so uh, Calvert had trained using um, Blakey's model, this idea of balance. And so then he sees Sandow and realizes that the physique that he wants to, to be able to get really strong um, is not going to be developed using these lightweights, high repetition kind of things. And so he starts to look for uh, implements to be able to do the heavy kind of training that he'd like to do. And he finds out pretty quickly they're not commercially available. And so he starts the Milo Barbell Company in 1902. And then to promote the Barbell Company, but also to disseminate ideas about how to train, he starts uh, a magazine called Strength Magazine in 1914. And so that magazine um, fairly early on talks about individuals like wrestlers and boxers who train with weights, but um, overtly refutes the idea of those athletes becoming muscle bound. So in particular, I remember an article talking about a boxer where um, Calvert or the author of the article talked about how this boxer uh, really, really fast. Um, and so obviously weights hadn't slowed him down. So Strength Magazine is, is read by individuals who are interested in uh, weight training. And so oh, there's another picture of Calvert. Um, and among those individuals is a guy named Bob Hoffman. So Bob Hoffman um, is um, a guy who takes up weight training so that he can beat his brothers in sports. So they are involved in various kinds of competitions. And so he takes up a type of weight training to beat them. Um, and ultimately it ends up being successful. And so he attributes his training to helping him beat his brothers. And then eventually, so Bob ends up serving uh, in the army in World War I for the US. And he attributes his training to helping him survive World War I, that he was uh, strong, he was agile. He, he tells stories about like doing somersaults over barbed wire and all kinds of things like this. Um, but that his training, and he earnestly believed that that had been the, the key thing that had helped him survive. He even talks about how um, his training helped him survive the Spanish flu um, in 1918. So he then, when he gets back from the war, buys one of the Milo barbells, begins training with it, and then engages again in, in other types of competition. Uh, he claims that he won an impressive variety of competitions from things that we would associate with track and field, like shot put, but he also claims that weight training helped him win a sack race and various other things. Um, but nonetheless, he believes weight training helped him and he'll tell anybody that weight training will enhance your performance. And so he, um, when he comes back from the war, works at an oil burner factory. And then by 1929, he starts manufacturing barbells at this oil burner factory. And then three years later in 1932, he starts his own magazine, Strength and Health, which functions very much like Strength Magazine a couple decades earlier to promote his barbells. It also, of course, tells people how to train, but it's a lot like what the Spaldings did, where it's a sort of uh, manual in a way to help people understand the utility of barbells. And an important thing that he does is in the very first issue of Strength and Health in 1932, he says weight training will improve any man in his chosen sport. So it doesn't matter what your sport is, weight training is going to help you do that. And so one of the things um, Dr. Terry Todd talking about uh, Bob Hoffman um, refers to him as, as a relentless 
uh, PR person, right? So he's always talking about weights and, and always talking about how they're going to help you. And so one of the individuals who read Hoffman's ideas and, and read Strength and Health magazine um, was a guy who'd go on to be a physician, Dr. Thomas DeLorme. That's him on the left, uh, deadlifting with his own um, implement that he made. So even though there are some commercially available barbells, a lot of people that train, uh, you know, particularly prior to 1950, are using these implements that they've scrounged themselves. So that includes, um, you know, luminaries in the iron game like Joe Weider um, had fashioned his own weight set at one point. And so that's uh, DeLorme's um, homemade weights that they're using train wheels, train wheels as the basis for it. But DeLorme, when he's young, ends up um, acquiring a, uh, a bacterial infection that's, um, so it's um, rheumatic fever, I believe. Yeah. But at any rate, fever. what's that? It is rheumatic fever. Yeah. Okay, good. Thanks. Um, so he ends up uh, getting rheumatic fever, which is bacterial infection, uh, and which can cause problems with the heart. And so the doctors at the time tell him that there's this um, sort of joke in the, the physical culture magazines that all the doctors would prescribe at the time were the three R's, rest, rest, and more rest. And again, that idea kind of goes back to the thoughts about vitality, that if you've got disease that's sort of sapping your energy, if you are too active, then that's going to make it worse and make you sicker. And so what you want to do is just rest and recover. That's, that's all you can do. So basically, that's the doctor's only advice to him is to, to rest. Um, and so Delorme is laid up in bed, um, resting. And in that process, though, he decides that he's going to make himself healthy and strong again. And so he starts reading um, medical books, but he also starts reading these physical culture magazines and begins his own training. Um, and again, his primary magazine that he's reading is Strength and Health. And so he takes up his training program and eventually becomes quite strong, um, strong enough that he's able to go and uh, perform weightlifting or a weightlifting demonstration at, at the halftime of an Alabama football game. Um, and so, again, that's, you know, that's a key part of, of his recovery. Um, and so ultimately, though, he ends up going to medical school. And so he goes to medical school at NYU. Um, in the early 1940s, and he ends up in the Army in 1944. And he's stationed at uh, Gardner General Hospital in Chicago. And so at the time, in keeping with that idea of the three R's of rest, rest, and more rest, um, when individuals are coming back from the war with various orthopedic injuries, they are typically prescribed these very rest-based protocols. And what resistance training they do is very low intensity, high repetition stuff. So a lot of the fairly common protocols would be sets of 20, um, one or possibly a few more sets. Um, and they do those three times a day. And then they were instructed or the, the therapists were instructed if the muscles appear to be tired, then go ahead and stop, right? So you always stop at the point of fatigue. Um, and so then the individuals would progress from these very lightweight protocols directly to games. So you'd go from that to now you're, you're playing some sort of a game. Um, so things um, like basketball or, or baseball, those kinds of things where you've got still, you know, an example of a knee injury, you still got a fairly weak knee that you've done some high repetition, low intensity training for. And now you're going to go put it in this really unstable environment where you're changing direction. And of course, there tended to be a lot of re-injury. Um, the outcomes weren't very good. And so there was a, a young paratrooper who came to DeLorme at the hospital um, in Chicago, and he'd basically gone through those protocols. He hadn't recovered, um, and he was a fellow weightlifter, or had been. Um, and so they decided to initiate this, this uh, weight training protocol where the, uh, his name was Thaddeus Kowalik, was the name of the paratrooper. They do this uh, heavier weight protocol that's basically uh, knee extensions, really relatively heavy knee extensions. And so with that, um, Kowalik makes this pretty impressive recovery from his ACL tear that he suffered uh, in the course of his service. And so after that, after Kowalik's pretty impressive recovery, more individuals come to DeLorme and ask if they can perform a similar pr protocol, get good results. It kind of spreads to the hospital, which then spreads uh, throughout the army and becomes the um, protocol for uh, rehab. So that system becomes known as progressive resistance exercise. So that is the system that becomes three sets of 10. Um, the sort of modified version of the system is 50% of their one rep or of their 10 repetition maximum for a set of 10, 75% for a set of 10, then 100% for a set of 10. So it's basically like one set all out. 
Um, but there's various iterations of the program that kind of ends up being the final version of the program. But nonetheless, the important part about Delorme is that he, because he's a physician, gives the idea of fairly intense weight training this medical validation. So whereas the medical community, particularly in the late 1800s, early 1900s, had really eschewed uh, high intensity training, Delorme and his progressive resistance exercise program gives it this medical validation. It works in a variety of, of uh, orthopedic injuries. They also used it with quite a bit of success in polio patients and other populations as well. So in the muscle magazines though, before there's this scientific validation and even in the days after, um, what the muscle magazines do, so there's a copy of Strength and Health on the right, that's the cover as you can see from November of 1954. Um, what they do is to use the examples that they have. They basically say, well, there's not really any research or they don't overly say it, but essentially because there's no research showing that um, heavy training is beneficial for athletes, they point to famous athletes who've lifted weights, look how successful they are, here's their weight training program, obviously lifting weights isn't gonna be bad for your performance. And so one of the key athletes um, is Frank Stranahan, who's there on the left, he was an amateur golfer. He won more than 50 amateur championships in the middle part of the 20th century. And the reason that Stranahan is so important, aside from his obviously impressive physique, is that as a golfer, both um, Hoffman's magazines and Joe Weider's magazines use him as an example to say, look, uh, golf is a sport that requires fairly fine motor skill. Stranahan is very strong uh, and obviously very uh, physically well built. And if he's been able to be so successful in golf, this fine motor type of sport, um, despite his training or because of his training, then obviously it's not going to hurt your performance in football, basketball, all of these other sports. They also pointed to athletes like Stan Jones there in the lower right. So Stan Jones um, was an offensive guard at the University of Maryland. He goes on to be inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and they detail his training, when he started, um, his actual program, those kinds of things. And so they use these examples of these athletes who are really successful to say, look, obviously this will enhance your performance. And in addition to individuals who train with weights, they also at times talk about teams who've trained with weights and the, the essentially miraculous turnarounds that they've had. So this example comes from the Chicago Town Club swim team. And it's notable because it's showing a, an entire team of female swimmers lifting weights. Um, but one of the stories that the magazines liked to tell a lot in the 1950s was of these teams who decided to take up weight training on a team-wide level and just this huge turnaround that they experienced. So for example, um, the University of Washington Huskies in 1958, they, uh, their season record in football is three and seven. The following year after taking up a weight training program, they completely turn it around and go nine and one. Um, there's a similar story at the high school level with a team from, from Florida, the Flying L's. They go from a losing record one year, everybody, or there's a team-wide weight training program. The next year they go nine and one, right? And so there's these, these huge turnarounds once these teams take up weight training. So Bob Hoffman is the guy who, you know, is perpetually promoting the, the utility of lifting weights to enhance performance, but he wasn't the only one. So Joe Weider, who um, typically we associate more closely with bodybuilding, Joe Weider also promoted the utility of lifting weights for athletes, um, going so far as in 1963, starting a, a spinoff from one of his magazines, which was Mr. America, that becomes All-American Athlete. And so All-American Athlete does the same kind of thing. They talk about successful athletes that have lifted weights. They talk about the programs that they've used. But in addition to that, they had this series where the series was called Barbells and. And so you just run through various sports. So this is barbells and bowling. There's barbells and football, basketball, and an impressive variety of sports. But the gist of this series, what they would do, as you can see there, is they would say, okay, you know, here's, here's the bowling motion. So you're getting plantar flexion here, you're pushing off, you're getting contraction of gastroc soleus, et cetera. So how would we strengthen this motion? So then we do heel raises to strengthen this. You're getting some knee extension at number two. So we're gonna do half squats to facilitate knee extension. So it's this idea of training the muscles that are used in the movement. And so again, this is uh, the early 1960s when you're seeing this. So that's on the popular press side, both Hoffman's magazine, magazines and Weider's magazines are using examples of athletes who've lifted, who've been successful to tell other people that they should lift weights. Um, but, and there is some medi medical validation from Delorme's work, 
but there's still not a ton of research um, into the 1960s about this. And so you start to see, um, this goes back a little bit. So the, the individual pictured there at the left is a guy named C.H. McCloy. He was a professor for a long time at the University of Iowa. And so at Iowa in 1943, there was a uh, Naval pre-flight training school. So where they're training uh, individuals getting ready to go fly in the Navy. And so as part of the pre-flight training, the, um, trying to figure out the right word for him, but the, uh, the servicemen, will go with that, it's pretty all-encompassing. The servicemen would uh, train with barbells. And so some of McCloy, who was in the physical education department, some of his students saw these, uh, the servicemen training with barbells and they asked him, you know, wouldn't, isn't that bad for them? That's what we've always been told. And so McCloy goes through and, and says, essentially, that's a good question, I don't know. I don't, know, I don't have any experience with that. And so he decides to go through and, and comb the literature and finds in his words, almost nothing about the effect of weight training on performance. And so then he kind of conducts this experiment on himself. He takes up a, a more intense weight training program than he's used to. He had grown up doing gymnastics and endurance kind of training. Um, and so he takes up this weight training program to, to test it on himself, decides there's no bad effects. And so then he encourages grad students at Iowa to start researching uh, the effects of strength training. And so you get this long series of grad students at Iowa starting in the 1940s and into the 1950s who um, do a variety of experiments. Most of them early on are looking at comparing a weight training program to the required physical education class. It's mostly like calisthenics and that kind of thing. And they basically find that um, you get more better increases in muscular strength, power, endurance with the weight training program than you do with the calisthenic program. And then that evolves a little bit into the 1950s, and you start to see these more applied programs where uh, one grad student in particular worked with the basketball team at Iowa. And so he's able to, with his weight training program, take this pretty mediocre basketball team where they have essentially a 500 record for a few years in the mid-1950s, or sorry, early 1950s, to where in 1955 and 1956, they become a final four team after they implement the weight training program. Because again, they're one of the few teams that's doing that. Um, and so they, those publications start to give some, um, start to provide some, some evidence, um, scientific evidence that weight training actually helps performance. Another important individual on that front uh, is Peter Karbovich, pictured here. Um, similar story to McCloy. So Karbovich taught at Springfield College in the 1940s. He initially is a skeptic of weight training because um, he's heard all the things about weight training making you muscle bound and never really had any reason to question it until Again, Bob Hoffman is involved here as well, uh, until Bob Hoffman and some of the uh, U.S. Olympic team weightlifters come to Springfield and put on a demonstration. And so based on how fast, how powerful those athletes are, it becomes essentially impossible to believe that weight training would, would actually slow a man down. And so Karpovich then goes on to work on research into the effects of weight training. And so what you've got pictured here is they compared 300 weightlifters to 300 non-weightlifters and how fast they could turn this arm crank. And so the weightlifters could turn the arm crank faster than the non-lifters. So obviously lifting weights didn't slow you down. Another thing that he investigated was um, injuries related to weight training. He did this big um, survey research and found out that weight training didn't uh, was no more injurious than other sports. So that was important validation there. Um, trying to speed up. So in terms of uh, strength coaching, so Dr. Terry Todd is called Alvin Roy, the guy uh, who's kneeling here, the first modern strength coach. So Al Roy, um, another individual who, you know, has heard weight training is bad for athletes. Uh, he gets to work with Bob Hoffman in 1946. He, uh, while he's serving in the army, gets to work with the U.S. Olympic weightlifting team and, and uh, help them in their, in their uh, European tour. And so with that same kind of thing, uh, as we just saw with Karpovich, where he sees these U.S. Olympic weightlifters and realizes that, in fact, uh, they're very powerful athletes. And so obviously weight training isn't slowing them down. And so when um, Al Roy gets out of the Army and comes back to Louisiana, where he's from, he makes an offer to the high school coach at his alma mater, Estruma High School, and says, hey, I'd like to implement a weight training program for your football players. And so the coach is initially resistant, but the team had had a pretty rough season in, in the prior year, which is 1954. Um, they'd only had one loss, but they lost to their crosstown rival. And there starts to be some muttering about, you know, replacing the coach because they didn't get into the playoffs and those kinds of things. The coach, um, his name's 
uh, is James Big Fuzzy Brown, decides that maybe weight training is, is worth a shot because um, they're not doing well. So maybe we'll give it a shot. And so they start this team-wide weight training at the beginning of 1955. The team starts training in January. Um, and it's a pretty simple program. It's the squats, bench press, cap raises, those kinds of things. And they, they do this program from January all the way up to the beginning of the season. Over the course of those nine months, only one player fails to gain at least nine pounds. So you've got this team full of athletes who's been training for nine months, much bigger, much stronger, much faster. The team uh, the next year goes undefeated. They win the state championship game 40 to six, which is the largest margin of victory in the state championship games at the time. Um, and so very, very successful. They're led by um, Billy Cannon. And so Billy Cannon is pictured here doing deadlifts. This is him on the cover of Strength and Health. Um, he's a, a running back for Istruma, but then goes on to LSU. And, and at LSU, uh, he wins their first Heisman Trophy and helps them to their first national championship. He's joined in the backfield um, by uh, Jimmy, whose name last name escaped me at the moment, but that's okay. Um, by by uh, somebody who's going to the um, Hall of Fame as a running back for the Green Bay Packers, which the fact that I can't remember a Packer name is brutal, uh, but that's okay. okay. So, um, so basically, Roy then he starts out with his high school, Extreme High School in Baton Rouge turns it around for them. They go on to win the state championship. He then goes on to LSU, works with them. They go on to win a national championship. And then Billy Cannon wins the Heisman. And then Al Roy moves on to professional football from there. And so um, he has other jobs. He's not full-time as a strength coach. He, he has his own health clubs and those kinds of things. So um, like I said, Dr. Dr. Terry Todd has called him the first modern, modern strength coach. And then um, Boyd Epley has been called the, the first full-time strength and conditioning coach. Um, so that's a picture of Boyd Epley there on the left. So Boyd Epley is at the University of Nebraska in the late 1960s, and he's actually there as a scholarship pole vaulter. Um, and so when he's at Nebraska, he ends up getting hurt. Uh, he has a back injury that keeps him from competing in track. Um, and he works with the athletic trainers to set up a rehab program, but prior to coming to Nebraska, Boyd, like a lot of these other individuals in the story, has uh, he's familiar with uh, the muscle magazines. He's been reading them. He actually started training. He lifted with a bodybuilder um, when he was in high school, uh, as, a, as a junior in high school, started this bodybuilding program um, with somebody at a local gym. That really helps him develop physically, and then he's able to parlay that into a really good performance in the pole vault, and then eventually into track at Nebraska. But um, in the course of all that reading and that experience training, he's familiar with bodybuilding programs. He's familiar with Olympic weightlifting. He's familiar with the programs of powerlifters to some extent as well. And so while he's out with this back injury, he's working with the athletic trainers to develop a rehab program, but he's also kind of crafting his own program using what he knows from all of those other sources. And while he's there, that's a picture of him as a kid lifting. Um, and this is their original weight room when he's there rehabbing. It's in uh, this old building, Schulte Fieldhouse. And so you can see the old uh, universal machine and you can see a bunch of light dumbbells, obviously um, light years different than the Nebraska weight room now. Um, but while he's there in the weight room rehabbing his own injuries, uh, he starts to work with some of the other injured Nebraska athletes. And some of the football players start to come back to practice larger and stronger than when they left with their injury. And so that this is noticed by Tom Osborne, who at the time is the offensive coordinator at Nebraska. And so Osborne goes to the head coach at the time, whose name is Bob Devaney. And so uh, in these previous two seasons, in the uh, 67, 68 seasons, Nebraska has gone six and four. So Bob Devaney is kind of this victim of his own success where he's been really good at Nebraska, but now the team is kind of a, a middling team. And so there start to be some calls for change, uh, particularly among boosters in Omaha. And so even though Devaney has heard that lifting weights is going to be bad for athletes, he's in the same kind of position as the high school coach at Estruma. And he says, okay, we'll give it a shot. So the team starts this team-wide training um, under Epley in 1960, kind of the off season before the 1969 season. They experience this big turnaround as well. In 1969, they go nine and two. They smash uh, their big rival, the, the Oklahoma Sooners, 44 to 14. They go on to win the bowl game very big. Um, and so then 
Uh, Epley is placed in charge of the program by 1970, and the team goes on to win back-to-back -back national championships in 1971. Um, and so you get this um, this clear evidence that with one with an individual who knows what they're doing running the weight training program, you can see this huge improvement in performance. And there's a couple of more photos of Epley. And so my last thing is, um, so Epley goes on to be a, a key founder of the NSCA. Basically, by 1977, he has this conversation with the commissioner, Boyd McWhorter of the SEC. Um, and so McWhorter asks Epley what his job is at Nebraska. And so Epley describes it and McWhorter is surprised, um, didn't know such a thing existed. And so essentially Epley decides, hey, we need to um, get some recognition for our field. We need to organize. And so he uh, sort of spearheads this campaign to connect with other strength coaches across the country and create this organization, this umbrella organization, which initially is the National Strength Coaches Association to uh, help unite strength coaches and to help sort of disseminate best practices. So they go from um, disseminating best practices or talking about programs that individual schools do to um, as best they can in the early 80s, trying to disseminate what research is out there on strength training, which is still not very much in the early 80s to uh, kind of by the mid 80s, they're sort of sponsoring their own research. And then they have a research only journal by uh, 1987, which is uh, what becomes the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research. So I think I'll stop there so that I don't go too far over on time. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's some pretty tremendous information that you guys shared. And I'm looking back at this and, um, just thinking about recently, I was at a conference and you know, there's some dinner tables set up, things like that. And I'm sitting there at the table next to Boyd Epley and they're honoring specific coaches. You know, Jeff Madden just got inducted. Um, it's a hall of fame for coaching, uh, a big honor. And, and he's sitting there with Boyd Epley and starting kind of with this presentation, it's kind of fresh in my memory. And then, you know, we have Dr. Todd going all the way back to ancient Greece uh, and then into Benjamin Franklin. Uh, and then John St. Clair, Alvin Roy, was, I think a lot of strength coaches now are maybe more familiar with maybe Alvin Roy. And I know everyone is familiar with um, Boyd Apley. So to kind of see how that all started from thousands, thousands of years ago, all the way until today is pretty awesome. Um, so I appreciate that. And thank you both. Thank you, Gabe. I was going to say, there's so many great stories in this, in this history that um, I know when Jason and I were working on the book, um, we had a hard time choosing the stories that we wanted to sort of focus on, honestly, because there's just, there's a lot of them out there. And they're like some of those gym guys that I was talking about in the 19th century, you know, um, there's pictures of William Wood drawn like the pictures of Professor Harrison, only he's holding up dumbbells over his head, things like this. And, um, you know, these, and, you know, you, we don't think about men looking like that, you know, back in those days. Um, I was, I was just going to say that I think that um, one of the things about Boyd that you may not know, Gabe, is when, um, when he was there in the 70s, after, not, not when you have the picture of the room with the universal machine in it, but after he took over, they had one bench at first, like the first year of the program, and um, Boyd has donated that bench to us at the Stark Center. So we actually have it in the back with all of its red vinyl and... Uh, it's a kind of, you know, it's special because it's, it was there at the really at the birth of what we would have to call modern strength coaching, because this is really when the modern era starts. And, um, and one of the other great innovations about the field, of course, is all the, the record keeping and the data and the kinds of things that we now monitor that previously we never, we never took into consideration. I mean, coaches might keep track of, you know, 48 or dash times and verticals. But, um, but, you know, what kind of tonnage people were lifting and how many sets and reps and, you know, the influx of when people began using periodization and other kind of forms of, you know, sort of organized training as opposed to the things where you were, you know, like Richard Berger's three sets of six, you know, which was what most of the guys in the 60s were lifting on. Um, those are all really important innovations that advanced, um, you know, the subtitle for the book is that Jason and I, because really Terry had passed by the time the book was finished, was really like this is the subtitle is a history of the innovation that transformed sport. And I really do think that strength training 
is one of the most profound changes in the world of sports that we've seen. Yeah, no, no question. I think this presentation helped us a little bit in understanding that. Uh, Dr. Shirley, I have a question. I think I read in it. How much was Boyd Epley making at Nebraska as a strength conditioning coach there? Oh, I think I, I saw. I think I saw two dollars. I think I saw two dollars. Two dollars an hour sounds right. Yeah, it's. Uh, but he was a student too. Remember, he was. He was. So, yeah, because so he began. So he began as an undergrad student, and and I would have to say, in, uh, you know, you think about the late sixties. So I think Boyd's Boyd's older than I am. I think a bit, but basically, like I remember babysitting for fifty cents an hour in the sixties, and uh, you know, so the whole pay scale was really different. And I think, you know, I'm pretty sure that I don't think Terry was making at, like as a teacher at a university in the late 60s. I don't think Terry ever made $10,000 in the 60s a year. I mean, the whole salary scale was just completely different. So, yeah, two, so bucks about, was a, two bucks was not minimum wage, probably. Yeah. So from, I mean, just in 60 years, let's zoom out here and just the last 60 years in itself, um, this is going to lead to another question is we've gone from. Boyd Epley making $2 an hour, which maybe was a little bit more than we think it is today laughing at that. But now we have football strength coaches and uh, Dr. Shirley, you mentioned in the beginning, close to a million dollars, I believe, a coach from Oklahoma State now is above a million per year. Um, yeah. So, and that's, that's just in a 60 year span. So my question to the both of you is, um, Obviously, you have an excellent view of the history up until this point now that you provided us in the last hour or so, but having an understanding and appreciation for the history of this, let's discuss maybe a little bit from here onward, where do you hope to see the profession of strength and conditioning go moving forward? <laughs> I'll start, then I'll start, then you can take over. So I, I think one thing that I would just say, um, and this isn't like where the whole field goes. I still wish we could see more women involved in strength coaching and coaching male athletes as well as female athletes. I mean, I think, I mean, I think about Andrea Hootie and some of the women like Meg Rich and Meg Richie Stone, who obviously have proven the competence that they have. And I know there's lots of other women out there, but we don't see many women in head jobs still. And so I think that's will change over time. I think that um, you know. Feminists would want to talk about the old boys network, which I think still functions a good bit within strength coaching. But, um, but I think that's a, that would be a definitely a transformative change. But the other problem on the other side of that is that a lot of women still feel like they want a male coach because there's that idea like, do they really feel comfortable that the female will know, will know what to tell them to do? For, and that's continued to be somewhat of a problem. Um, I think that I think the great advantage that at the college level, that one reason that universities may be thinking more about paying strength coaches these high, higher salaries is because they are the one coach that has year round access to the athletes. And, um, and that's going to be increasingly important with the new changes related to amateurism and funding and these kinds of things. And I think, you know, I was thinking about Jeff Madden, who's a very good friend of mine and I admire so much. And I think about Jeff and the great work that he did here at Texas, but it's also because Jeff was also like, not exactly just the father figure to the guys, although he was that for a lot of the guys, but he was also the person who could, they could, that the athletic department knew was keeping track of people a little bit. And that's, and that's where being the strength coach is, it's a little bit more complicated job than I think just knowing how many sets of reps you want somebody to do. And I, Jason? I was gonna say in terms of where it's going, I think one of the things that the profession has done generally pretty well is, is to embrace that the scientific aspect, at least insofar as, as quantification. Like a lot of the really early stuff used to be, here is the successful program, Nebraska, for example, here's what they do. And then people just kind of copycat it very similar to the way that people would copycat like a really successful offense um, in football or basketball. Um, and so I think now there's, there's a lot more effort to measure things, to put numbers on them, and then to base decisions on those numbers, right? So with some of the, the new technology, some of the wearables and those kinds of things where um, 
they can look at uh, athlete loads and then vary them depending on those kinds of things. Um, so I, I think that's that's been good. Is is rather it's really evolved from not just seeing what successful programs do and doing that to um, being more like independent practitioners making decisions based on data. So I, I think the think and hope that that trend will continue. Uh, well, great. Well, uh, we're getting to the end here and I have some closing remarks. But before I do, just again, want to say thank you so much to both of you. And uh, if you have any other you know, parting words or anything else you'd like to add, uh, now would be a great time if you'd like to. I just, I, uh, I just wanted to, sir, thank you and thank Kaiser for letting us do this. I mean, I, and I really applaud, you know, the effort to, um, to try to have an educational outreach as part of the company. I mean, I think that's really brilliant. And uh, I was actually thinking when Jason was talking about Bob Hoffman, that really that's what Bob was doing with his magazines. You know, he was like trying to educate the public so they understood the value of what we were doing. And now we're doing that on the internet with podcasts and other kinds of things in the same way. So um, anyway, so thank you, Gabe, for letting us do this. And it's always nice to talk about the book. And, and I have to say that um, Jason, Jason and I collaborate on a lot of work together. And um, so it's always also fun for me just to get to see his face. So thanks for that. Yeah, I would, didn't have anything to add, but I really appreciate the opportunity. It was fun to do, and it was fun to kind of go back and prepare for this. So I really enjoyed the opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think it was really cool, at least just listening, um, like this Sinclair, uh, when Sinclair reaching out to people across and asking yeah. them, what are they doing, taking note of what people are doing. It's well, like, and it's and, 200 and years those, later, same thing. Yeah, I can send you some copies of that if you want to see it. But because the, the first one that comes back, the letters, it's not a publication. It's like, there were maybe like 40 copies printed and a lot of it is just longhand letters of people, but, um, but it's what's in them. And it's that, and essentially you're being advised that you, you're training a racehorse, you know, that you, you, you change the food, you change the diet, all this kind of stuff. And then when you start looking at what they're saying about humans, it's, it's pretty close. So it's that there, and it's because it's because we don't have a profession yet, you know, which is really, which is really what Jason and I were talking about in the book is like, you know, how do we go from the, like, really like weightlifters and people running gyms were by a lot of the physical education community considered to be like crackpots. I mean, we weren't considered like experts because we were in physical culture. And so to go from where we were to now to, you know, a strength coach earning a million dollars a year at a major university, that's an astonishing transformation. Even if it's a century later, it's just an astonishing transformation. So, yeah, no all question. Right. Well, yeah, that's all the time we have for today. And a big thank you to our attendees that joined us live for the KES. A huge thank you to our two panelists, Dr. Jan Todd and Dr. Jason Shirley. We appreciate their time and all their knowledge they shared with us today about the history of strength conditioning profession. Please be sure to give them both a follow on social media, Dr. Todd on Twitter and Instagram. She's super active. She's got a lot of great stuff. So make sure she give you a follow. Uh, and Dr. Shirley and Dr. Shirley on Twitter as well. And the Stark Center as well on Instagram uh, is definitely one to follow. So make sure you look up the Stark Center, see what's going on over there. If you want to learn more about the history of sport and physical culture, visit www.starkcenter.org. It's a great resource that we cannot recommend enough. If you ever get the chance to visit Austin, Texas, uh, the Stark Center is a hidden gem on the UT campus. It's located in the north end zone of Darrell K. Royal Stadium, and it'll absolutely blow you away. Uh, we also include a link to the book, Strength Coaching in America. Make sure you pick up a copy. You won't want to put it down. And undoubtedly, like today, we'll develop a greater appreciation for the profession of strength conditioning. This discussion will be publicly available on the Kaiser Fitness YouTube page, and the audio will be up on Spotify as well under Kaiser Education Series. Thank you to everybody that joined us today and over the last few months for any of our KES panels. We hope you enjoyed them as much as we did. Uh, it's been an honor to be able to sit down and learn from incredible practitioners that we've had on. Season two of the Kaiser Education Series will be back in September and we look forward to continuing to share quality human performance education. Thank you and have a great day. Thanks, Gabe. Bye-bye.